the largest churches in the South also apparently give out the largest salaries. This is according to a report done by the Leadership Network and the Vander Blumen Search Group. According to Huffington Post, the survey found 14% of large churches have a financial bonus structure for their top leader. Interesting. And about one in five of the big congregations finds ways to collect their money other than passing around the collection plate. And that includes things like online, um, uh, kiosks in the lobby, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? They're pretty good at raising money, essentially. Now, Northeastern churches are the second highest paying, followed by the West and then the Midwest. Now, this is a, a fact that you're probably not going to be too surprised about. The lowest paying region in North America is Canada. A little bit of credit for Canada on this one. Now, the report points out that the fact that in these places where pastor salaries are higher, wages are often lower than average. Interesting. Now, these two really aren't too related, but nonetheless, I find them both on their own equally fascinating. Now, the report also looked at some trends that are as follows. The larger the church, the more the senior pastor is likely to get paid. Makes sense. The second in command at many churches earns about 70% of the salary of the top executive. Okay. Three quarters of the churches give pay raises between 1 and 5%, and the most common raise was about 3% for 2014. Interesting factoids about what they're doing in the churches. 80% of the large churches were predominantly white, while 20% were made up mostly of another racial or ethnic group or were multi-ethnic. The larger the church the more likely it is to be a multi-site congregation. Also something that seems to make a little bit of sense. Now, I want to go to you guys, to my panel here, and ask what really strikes you about this report? What do you think? What's your opinion on all this? I find, I mean, the whole kind of giving money and the, the mega church leaders receiving vast sums in terms of their income just seems outrageous and a rather unchristian thing to have, you know, the whole rich man pass through the eye of a need or all of that sort of nonsense. But the thing that shocks me the most is the that last fact you mentioned there, that eighty percent are predominantly white, um, and then the other twenty percent they're just predominantly of another ethnicity. And it just seems to be sort of I don't know whether it's just a it's not a conscious decision maybe, maybe it is for some people, but just segregation in terms of mega churches. And you do tend to see it when you see the clips online and when they're shown on TV. When you kind of the camera pans around, it will just be a room of completely white people or a room of completely black people or Hispanic people. And I find that kind of I know a bit weird in a way. I wouldn't I can maybe understand reasons why, but that's the thing that I just found most troubling. That it seems to be a real segregation amongst the churches, it seems, or at least certainly amongst the mega churches. I would like to preface my statement by being honest with you guys and letting you know that I am a staunch atheist. So I see a lot of things wrong with this. But what bothers me the most is that these people are preying on believers and sucking out so much funds to do these <laughs> aesthetically pleasing grandstanding events and buildings. It's just, it's really appalling and it's infuriating to me that we're not taxing these assholes. So all this money that they're sucking out of our communities and they're not putting it back in. A lot of the areas that are around these mega churches are either in bumfuck nowhere or in areas that are highly poor, and this money could obviously go back into the community, to the people that they're sucking dry, these fucking vampires, and actually help these people, or maybe help the schools that are in, in their communities. Like they, the selfishness of the leaders of these megachurches is so appalling, and I, I don't see how these followers can read their scripture and read how modest their Jesus lived and then go to a church like that and then go home to their shitty apartment and think everything is fine. There's nothing weird about that. There's nothing off off kilter. None of it. 
everything is hunky dory. I mean, just before um, Jordan jumps in, I mean, full disclosure that I'm an anti theist and I think these mega churches are, in some sense, evil. But I know kind of people push back and say, you know, certainly these mega church parties, oh, look at all the charitable work that we do kind of within the community. Kind of, we run, you know, these events and those events, we give some money to homeless shelters and stuff. And whilst that's all fine, and most religions, they say, oh, look at all the good work we do. You know, we get given all this money and then we help, help a lot of people. But the fact is, it's really inefficient help. If these mon- if if they gave up their salaries, just take that for instance. I mean, there's a whole ton of wealth of kind of maintaining the massive mega churches of buildings that they're in, these massive cathedrals. Just take the salary that these pastors get. Um, if they, you know, they don't need those sort of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some of them are on. They could give they could give that out and help even more people. But they don't want to. They're in it for themselves. And Haven's right. They are preying on the on the vulnerabilities of people. They're just as bad as psychics and tarot card readers, in my opinion. They're preying on people's emotional vulnerability. And yes, the, kind of these churches they do provide emotional support for many people. But I feel like people can find emotional support in other ways without having to give up their hard-earned money. And as you, you're right, in a lot of these places, it is in poorer communities where they need every single dollar that they earn to get by, and they're giving it and basically furnishing these pastors no doubt lavish lifestyles and it is just a little bit sickening and you just you just wish that these people would kind of just wake up and think oh I can still go to church and fine but I don't need to give money you don't need to give money to these churches it's just not necessary one more point uh, until Jordan really quick this kind of shows you know uh, the the stat about people you know, in these lower lower income, lower wage areas giving more money, it just shows how good people are. I mean, you can look at the positive side of this and see that these people who don't have much of themselves give more to a cause that they think is good. I mean, these churches, you know, do, do charitable things, and they think that, that a lot of that money is going to charity, and they're tithing, they're being good, you know, what they think in their mind is good, being a good Christian. I'm giving to the church, I'm giving to my community. Because the church services my community, so the, it just shows how these people are good people, and say that you know we're we're giving so much of ourselves to this church. All right. Uh, so as the the person, uh, uh, the only person on the panel who is not only not an agnostic, atheist, or anti-theist, I think I hit all three of you there, um, but also has been a pastor. Um, I can assure you that that. Uh, uh, what you guys have to say is, is very valid uh, from a Christian perspective. I don't know that it's valid from a non-Christian um, perspective uh, because basically what you're, you're approaching is how a non-profit should work. Um, and there's a very good argument to be made that non-profits should be run like CEOs and that the CEOs of non-profits should make a lot of money if they bring in a lot of money because that brings, in, that brings you better talent to bring in more money. We don't really do charity that way, and I don't know that we should. But there is an excellent TED Talk. Uh, forget the guy who did it. Jeff, if you could maybe Google that for me while I'm talking, that would be awesome. Um, like, he didn't convince me, but he made me rethink at least, you know, maybe it's a valid assumption. But anyway, churches are not nonprofits. Churches are religious organizations, and so I don't think the... the or churches are nonprofits, I should say, but that... What works to raise money is not necessarily how a church should be run. Is what I'm trying to get at. Um, when I was a pastor, I uh, I made $150 a week. Um, so uh, yeah, I was just you know raking in all the money from from those sheeple and and saving it for my lavish lifestyle um, at $150 a week. Um, but uh, to your point, they, these places don't just offer emotional support. They feed the sick. They or they feed the hungry, they heal the sick, they clothe the homeless. Um, uh, to Haven's point about how they could be giving to schools, they do give to schools. Some of them have schools, which presents its own set of problems because then it's a private versus public school thing. But, you know, that's that's another discussion for another day. Um, but I, I would have to disagree with you there. If If you're making all that money, there shouldn't be homeless people in your community. If I'm you're inclined to agree with you. And, like, if you look at, and I, I'll give credit where credit is due, if you look at what the Mormon church is doing in Salt Lake City, they pretty much eradicated homelessness in their area because to them they take, their, they take what they read in their scripture seriously. 
But th th those Mormons are also as wealthy as they can be, and that's where right, I'm going. But, I, but my problem is, and it, my problem is not just with the church. I think the NFL should not have this, you know, should not have this privilege either. They're also a nonprofit, and they, I don't understand how people can see the NFL and not see that this is a, a profit motive organization. So obviously, mm -hmm. we are screwing, like, my main issue is that we are screwing over people who can no longer be screwed over. We have enough people sucking the life out of us that we, the institutions that these people look towards, they look towards the church to be there for them, to protect them, to find guidance in them, to find communities in them. And maybe not someone like you, but Joel Olstein is sucking the life out of these people. Well, and, and that was something I wanted to get at. Joel Olstein's brand of Christianity is a you you become a Christian to make money kind of thing, uh, right. and there are a lot of mega church pastors out there like that. Uh, but then there are a lot of other mega churches that approach it just from a standpoint. Uh, and this is basically what a mega church is. It's it's an American model of Christianity that was raised that was raised in this free market American idea, and the church is run more like a business uh, than it is like the church is traditionally run. And what I mean by that is not that it's run to make money. I mean, it's it's the way that success is measured is off of the same kind of metrics that a uh, uh, that a business would be measured. So things like numbers and turnout, you know, there's going to be a lot of data and stuff like that. Like that's how a pastor gets judged as a success. Whereas in the past, a pastor, you know, would have been judged as successful, you know, by the, the bonds and the connections that he formed, you know, with the people who in his parish. And churches would have been much smaller. Obviously, well, in a mega church like this, you're not going to be able to form those bonds. And I have a serious problem with that. To me, that is a very worldly way to approach church. Whether or not it raises a lot of money and does a lot of good, uh, to, to me, is kind of an unchristian concept. Um, just because I think Christianity is all about while well, well, maximizing the effort you put into something that you don't necessarily make the effort for the the turnout or for what is quote unquote supposed to work, uh, but you know you do it because it's the right thing and because you believe it's what uh, God has called us to do. Um, Dan Pelota, the way uh, we think about charity was what I was referencing. Thanks for that, Jeff. Um, I do have the, a question. I yeah. do have a question, and I don't mean to put the voice of Christianity on your shoulders, but since you're the only believer here, I kind of have to. Mm -hmm. You obviously recognize the fault in this system, and I'm pretty sure that there are more Christians that recognize the fault in this system than don't. So why don't you guys have a self-correcting mechanism within your community to slow this down or stop them or point, at the very least, give acknowledgement to what these people are doing. Because I know a lot of um, a lot of atheists that are very progressive and very, you know, out there are more than willing to point this thing out. But I think that none of that would change unless it changes within the community. So do you see any change go or any direction or any possibility of a direction going in that way? Well, um, well, sure. Gosh, there's all sorts of movements and – well, not even movements because the megachurch is a fairly new invention. Um, again, like I say, it's, it's an American phenomenon. Uh, but uh, the reason why megachurches spring up and, and can't be corrected is because, like, to, back to my point, to the nature of a megachurch. Megachurches are either are, – they're going to be mostly either non-denominational – uh, meaning they don't answer to any greater denominational body other than themselves, or uh, Southern Baptist, uh, or other uh, or what you would call Congregationalist traditions uh, that are going to fall into Evangelical Protestantism, um, and uh, the the one of the the foundational uh, uh, pillars of that branch of Protestantism is the autonomy of the individual church. Even in the Southern Baptist Convention, where your uh, your churches are loosely linked together and get together and have a convention, that convention cannot make a binding declaration about anything. Um, uh, the only like so basically the only thing the Southern Baptist Convention actually has control over uh, is its missionaries. In terms of the individual churches, each church has autonomy, um, and then that that's true uh, of the of the non-denominational churches, obviously. And that was where I was going uh, earlier, talking about how these things are run like corporations. Uh, so they're not run as part of a greater whole. They're run as they start out as a startup, and since you don't have an ecclesiastical structure, meaning you don't have you know deacons, uh, 
priests, bishops, archbishops, cardinals, etc. Uh, basically, your pastors, since they can't become bishops, they have to become super pastors, and they they grow these this giant startup into a giant business. And then, uh, in the case of well, I'm, I'm not going to name any of them, but in the case of some of them, they uh, uh, basically they become a, dom a non-denominational denomination. Uh, and instead of kind of uh, manifesting itself as a, a church in a denomination, they, it becomes a corporation, and they just start out branches, you know, pretty much named after whatever the first church was. Um, and it's it's like I say, it's a very from if you're judging things, like I say, from the American model uh, and looking, you know, at the way the world would judge success, it can be a very successful model. It can grow churches and it can do a lot of good if it's used properly. Obviously. Uh, it can also be abused, and I think you were you pointed out an excellent situation there with Joe Olstein, uh, who is more of a, a theological abuser. But we've certainly seen pa how many pastors have we seen in scandals about you know what they're doing with their money. So it can be abused in much more nefarious ways. And I have a problem with it strictly on theological grounds. Um, uh, but uh, to wrap it up, I think uh, like fast pastors work their tails off. I know that because I've been one. Um, the, uh, in my uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, introduction to ministry classes back in college, we uh, we looked at this uh, survey that was done, where different parishioners were asked uh, how much um, they expected their pastors to spend, how many hours a week to spend doing different duties. And so it was you know sermon preparation, time at the church, visiting the sick, uh, going out and you know doing service projects, stuff like that. But they weren't asked to put it all together. Certain people were asked of a few of them. Other people were asking a few of them, so they didn't have any idea what the aggregate of hours would add up to be. And not only did it add up to more than a f the hours of a work week, it added up to more than there were hours in a week, period. Meaning they expected their pastors to be working more than 24 hours a day. And some of us were doing that for $150 a week. Um, but I think what pastors, the way that the churches should kind of handle this is to to pay pastors in ways that are harder to abuse. So, like, give them, you know, a parsonage, a place to live, give them a good insurance plan, but don't give them a ton of cash money uh, for them to go spend on a luxurious lifestyle. Like, you can, there's ways for the churches to manage resources in a way to, you know, thank the pastor and keep the pastor and his family safe and able to do what he's doing for the church, but are much harder to abuse than giving them tons and tons of money that could be spent better elsewhere.